Greetings, students. So before we get on to the French Revolution, we need to understand the world that the French were living in in 1789. We need to understand what the revolutionaries were actually pushing back against. And in order to do that, we're going to have to go back a ways. We're actually going to have to go back all the way to the end of the Protestant Reformation to see all the tension that was built, building up to that great French Revolution. Like we covered earlier, the French Revolution was really the climax of the Enlightenment. As much as Enlightenment thinkers were challenging traditional views of the world, you know, the idea that everybody is accepted as true, that kings were supposed to be in charge because God said so, or that scripture is just true because it was handed down from God in some way. Those were things that were just accepted as true throughout the medieval period and much of the early modern period. But the Enlightenment thinkers, in their method of doubt, challenge such things. And such widespread challenges to authority are always going to bring some chaos. Their ultimate goal, or the ultimate goal of the Enlightenment thinkers, was to create an orderly, more rational world. Remember, they believed in something called natural law, and they could look around the rest of the world and say it all works with a very specific set of laws. Crops grow when they're watered, when they're exposed to sunlight, when they're in the right temperature. And if you go into a forest, you have this complex ecosystem where everything is working in tandem with, it, with itself. And what they wanted was to see humans, civilizations, societies, states, to create laws and institutions that were in harmony with that natural law. They wanted to have a rational world, not one that was just built up off of ancient traditions and thinking that existed during the medieval period. And while the concept of sovereign states was over a century old by the end of the 18th century, their governments and bureaucracies of those states were still stuck in the Middle Ages. It wasn't always clear who was in charge of what, like in the modern day, we have a Secretary of State who is in charge of the State Department. At the DMV, we have a manager who is in charge, and we have tellers who are in charge of making sure that transactions with the public are done correctly. We know how our system is supposed to work. Not that it's not flawed, but we do have the idea of a rational system. If you go back to the early modern period, somebody might have the title of Chamberlain or Duke, but it didn't really mean that they were in charge of anything specific. It was really the king who usually would say like, oh, I favor this person. I want them to take care of the army right now, or I want this person to take care of tax collecting right now. And even beyond that, there were local lords, nobility, who quite often didn't even have to listen to the king. The kings were not always powerful enough to really force their will on others. So while a duke was supposed to be underneath a king, well, only really if the king could make him. You can see, this is pretty chaotic. It is certainly no way to run a state. And this is what the Enlightenment thinkers, one of the things they wanted to fix. Most governments were not centralized at all. We know about the Holy Roman Empire and how it was really just a collection of individual states. The emperor didn't have much of authority in most parts of the empire. And even in France, where the king was considered the absolute ruler in the 1700s, Nobles still had almost total authority over the peasants in their region. You're going to be hearing this term that comes up a lot, parlement. It looks like parliament. It is not exactly, it's not really the same thing as parliament in England. Parliament in England is the legislative body of England, like our Congress. The parlement of France were a collection of courts that really had almost ultimate authority over their region, of France and they were made up of the local nobility. And so even if a king wanted to pass a law or wanted to put out a law, even an absolutist king, they always ran into these parlements that could interpret that law by local customs or reject that law due to local traditions. And so all the absolutist rulers of France quite often did have a lot of control over their nobles. Their nobles still had almost total control over their local peasants. There were no universal laws for the entire Kingdom of France. Hell, there was not even a universal language. You can see here on this map, in the northern portion of France, we have the Langue d'Oil. These are essentially French languages. The language of Paris really is what we're going to end up thinking of as French, but there were many different dialects that existed throughout the north. And in the south, we have the Occitan languages. These were not 
French, and even those languages had many different dialects. Beyond these two major groups, we had Breton in the Northwest. Breton was actually a Celtic language related to, like, Irish. We had Dutch languages in the Northeast and Basque languages in the Southwest. There was not a unified French. If you traveled from one town to another, entirely different words would be used for the exact same thing. It's pretty hard to have a centralized kingdom or a centralized state when virtually everybody in that kingdom or state speaks very different languages depending on the regions that they live in. So in addition to different languages, each region had its own traditions, its own laws. It even had its own ways of collecting taxes. So when the king wanted to collect a tax, that was something that the peasants usually had to pay. As a matter of fact, almost all the time it's the peasants that paid the royal tax, but then they also had to pay taxes to the local nobility who could pass taxes however they wanted, independent of the king. This was an incredibly inefficient system. So much red tape and unclear system of rule that it made for tons of room for corruption, which of course also meant less money for the central government because things would be siphoned off before they ever made it to Paris. Now, we've learned a little bit about absolutism last week, but I do want to walk us through the development of absolutism in France, starting from the end of the Wars of Religion all the way up to the breaking out of the French Revolution. So back during those Wars of Religion, that period of the Protestant Reformation where there were many fights throughout Europe, in 1587, France fell into a civil war. The royal family was falling apart, and there were two major houses who saw an opportunity to take control. One of these was the House of Guise. They were a Catholic family that had the support of many Catholics throughout France, and the House of Bourbon, a Protestant family. In 1589, the House of Bourbon won. Henry IV was crowned the king. He reigned from 1589 to 1610. That's what that little R before uh, dates means, the period that somebody reigns or rules. Though Henry, even though he was a Protestant, Paris was the power base of all French kings, and Paris was totally Catholic. So Henry converted. And this should give us a sense, just to kind of one last uh, statement on the wars of religion and the Protestant Reformation. Most of the big players in it, they were not necessarily really devoted to one religious idea or the other. They just saw religion as a great way to get people on your side. So yes, Henry IV, Henry of Bourbon, was a Protestant his whole life, and he led Protestants in the fight to become king of France. But when it came down to it, when he had to get the Parisians to buy into his kingship, that was absolutely necessary for any king of France. They had to have the citizens or the people of Paris on their side. He went ahead and converted. Matter of fact, he had a famous line saying, Paris is well worth a mass. Mass being something that takes place in Catholic services, but not in Protestant services. This is something to keep in mind, by the way, when we get to the modern Middle East. We are going to see a lot of fighting between Sunnis and Shiites, uh, two sects of Islam. But the people that really head up those fights don't have as much of a religious quarrel with each other as much as they want power and they use religion to get a lot of people on their side to stoke partisan differences. Same thing was happening between the House of Bourbon and the House of Guise. It's Henry IV who really began the French royal ideas of absolutism. The idea that the king didn't need approval of the nobility to make laws or pass new taxes or declare war or anything else. All a king had to do was to speak and a law was made. At least this is the ideal of absolutism. And Henry himself was a pretty good ruler. He didn't really pursue absolutism just for the sake of power. For example, he gave Protestants religious freedom and, and even allowed them to serve in government. Really, Henry IV was trying to use absolutist ideology to try to return France to a state of peace. There were still those who wanted to pursue holy wars, and in 1610, he was actually assassinated by a Catholic zealot, somebody who really didn't buy his conversion to Catholicism. 
After him, his son, Louis XIII, took over. Louis XIII reigned from 1610 to 1643, and it was underneath Louis XIII that absolutism really got going. Henry IV planted the seeds. It's underneath Louis XIII that we really start getting momentum that direction. And a lot of that had to do with the first minister of Louis XIII. When you hear the term first minister, you can think like prime minister, essentially the guy that takes care of all the nitty-gritty of ruling while the king acts as a figurehead and tells his prime minister or his first minister what he wants him to accomplish. His first minister was a man named Cardinal Richelieu. If you've ever heard of the Three Musketeers, you might have heard of Cardinal Richelieu, their arch nemesis. And Richelieu really was the architect of absolutism in France. He did things like he had castles that were owned by nobility destroyed so that nobility couldn't fortify themselves against the monarchy. He began persecution of Protestants again. He believed that the country had to be unified underneath a single faith, which had to be the same faith as the kings. And remember, the House of Bourbon is now a Catholic family. And this really built the foundation for peak absolutism underneath the next king, Louis Fourteenth. Louis XIV reigned from 1643 to 1715, quite a long time. He's often referred to as the Sun King. He liked to use sun symbolism a whole lot all over his palace and in paintings of him. He cultivated the idea that the entire kingdom orbited around him as if he was the sun. We can see here that the scientific revolution has really started to take root even by the mid-1600s. He built a new royal palace at Versailles, which was about 10 miles outside of Paris. And this had two goals. One, he wanted to get away from the Parisian populace that sometimes got grumpy with kings. It was safer to live a little ways away. Remember, kings had to hold on to Paris. They, that really was the foundation of their power. But if the Parisians ever felt like kings weren't paying them enough respect, or that life wasn't going well enough and the king wasn't doing anything about it, they had a history of sometimes rising up against the king, throwing some riots, killing officials, things that you don't want to be in town for if you're the monarch. Just as important as getting away from Paris, though, he wanted to create a glamorous residence to promote an image of an all-powerful king, a place where all-powerful people in the kingdom would want to be. And the Palace of Versailles really became the it place. One of the things he wanted was the nobility of France to want to come to Versailles, to be at that center of power, to be at that center of luxury, to be at the center of style. And we can't discount, even in the modern day, how much public image and how much the cool factor drives power, where people want to feel cool. They want to feel like they're part of the latest, hippest thing. That's what Versailles was, and getting nobility to come there and treat him as a celebrity really took away a lot of the power they would have had if they stayed back in their provinces. He created a daily routine where nobility actually competed for his attention. The favorites got to help him get dressed and prepare for the day. Beyond those favorites who got to be near him during his morning routine, there were plenty of others who were wanting to get close to power. They would watch his daily routine. So, for example, they would try to get his attention during daily processions when he walked the halls of Versailles, maybe slip him a note, or maybe a, a member of his entourage. And for all of this pomp and circumstance, Louis XIV truly was a hard worker. He, he was the type of guy that would pull 20 hours a day every day trying to help manage his kingdom, keep an eye on problem areas, get ahead of problems, try to expand his kingdom's power. And being a hard worker, this is important, is an absolutely necessary trait for anybody who wants to be an absolutist ruler. You cannot be an effective absolutist ruler if you're not paying attention to everything going on in your kingdom. This is going to be a problem after Louis XIV. There's going to be a couple other kings who just aren't up to the task. And Louis XIV used the Catholic Church to buttress his power and help him manage his realm. He outlawed Protestantism in France. Remember, his grandfather, Henry IV, had actually said it's totally okay to be Protestant. But Louis XIV had this very famous state saying, One king, one law one faith. 
if he was going to be an effective absolute ruler, he had to be ruler over a unified kingdom. He couldn't have a kingdom where some people were Protestant, some people were Catholic. They wouldn't be totally loyal to him. And you can also see he's starting to think about trying to create one law for the entire kingdom, though that's still going to take a while to really tease out. When you have these systems of law in the different regions that have been there for a thousand years, it's pretty tough to just say we're going to throw that out the window. Law is generally based on precedent, on things that have come beforehand. And if you start unraveling that whole system, it's something that is really a recipe for chaos. This outline of Protestantism, though, it meant that a lot of French Protestants went, went to places like the Netherlands and Prussia. It really caused a bit of a brain drain on France and really benefited places like the Netherlands and Prussia. He was able to exercise his absolute power over all of France, but each region, like I said, still had their own customs and laws. You can see here we have a map of the different parlements and their regions of control or influence throughout France. Louis XIV tried to extend royal authority over these regions. He sent out uh, people that he called intendants. These are, are folks that were essentially supposed to act as royal representatives and hopefully, ultimately, as governors. But these parlements used ancient laws and customs to resist. Of course, if he could get those nobles to come hang out at Versailles with him, like many of them wanted to do to be near the center of power, that meant there weren't as many that could actually push back out in the provinces. So little by little, he was getting a little bit of unity across the kingdom. Though I, I can't emphasize enough, those parlements did not go away, and regional identities did not go away. There was not a single French nation at this point. There were essentially Parisians, and Bretons, and Basque folk, and, and folks that lived in Orléans, or other cities, that didn't identify as being the same peoples as those living in Paris. So we could say that Louis XIV unified France under his rule, but he did not unite France into a single nation. He was the embodiment of an ideal absolute ruler, and when he died in 1715, his great-grandson became king. He lived a long time, outliving his son and his grandson. Louis XV reigned from 1715 to 1774, another long reign, but he was much less interested in the nitty-gritty of ruling that his great-granddad had. He mostly left his first minister in charge of running the kingdom, and for most of his reign, his first minister was another Catholic cardinal. While Louis XV still maintained an image of personal control at Versailles, and certainly he still consulted with his first ministers, he just didn't have the work ethic that Louis XIV had. Losing some of this notion that everything really flows from the king, a lot of people were starting to see that a lot of law and a lot of policy flowed from the king's favorites, which is not the same thing, and they certainly didn't have a divine right to rule. So you can see how some of these old ideas of kingship and the rightful place of kings starting to diminish underneath Louis XV. Under the reign of Louis XV, the French treasury started really faltering. The upkeep of Versailles was super expensive. If you're going to go through daily rituals that involve a whole lot of expensive food and glamorous clothing, that is going to cost a lot. And as you can see over here in the Hall of Mirrors, this is not a cheap place to build and it is not a cheap place to keep staffed and maintained. It is also underneath Louis XV that France entered the Seven Years' War from 1756 to 1763. You've probably heard of this as the French and Indian War. This is the war where Americans actually attacked some French folk that, that we started a war, and ultimately the British have to get involved. It turns into a major European war. But the cost of this war is going to affect two groups in the long term. France which loses the war, loses territory, and had to spend a lot of money on it. Also, Britain had to spend a lot of money on this war, and after the French-Indian War, or the Seven Years' War, Britain wanted us, the American colonists, to start paying for the war that we had started, putting some new taxes on us. That's what's going to lead to the American Revolution. 
It's underneath Louis XV that many parlements were able to regain some of the power they had lost underneath Louis XIV. In trying to negotiate for more centralized power, Louis XV regularly gave nobles and the church more privileges. Clergy, members of the church, were almost always exempt from taxes. Nobles rarely paid much and paid virtually nothing underneath Louis XV, which of course meant that it was the lower classes, particularly the peasantry and the people who lived in the cities, who had to shoulder nearly the entire burden of taxation. After Louis XV died in 1774, his grandson was crowned king, Louis XVI, who ruled from 1774 to 1792. I know there's a lot of Louis. The way I normally think about it is we have Louis XV XV that's right in the middle of Louis XIV being the best, so IV XIV, and Louis XVI XVI being among the worst kings that France ever saw. Though not everything that went wrong was the fault of Louis XVI. He inherited a kingdom that was deeply in debt, one that had been on the losing end of recent wars, had lost much of its colonial possessions, and one that was still a crazy hodgepodge of languages and laws and customs. Tough to fix these debt issues when one can't even be sure of where all the tax money is coming from or where it's all going. And Louis XVI did try to do some good. He hired financial experts to help reform the tax system. He reinstated religious toleration, allowing Protestants and Jewish folk to freely practice their religion. But these efforts usually were thwarted by powerful nobles, using local parlement to, quote, redefine royal decrees in the context of local custom. And Louis was consistently reticent to make firm stands on his positions. This is something you have to remember about this guy. He is very wishy-washy. Even if he had a good idea, he'd come out, what we need to do is we need to standardize our taxation system, and I'm going to make it happen, and I hired on somebody that's going to help set all that up, and in the moment the nobility say, we don't like this, he would be, okay, I guess maybe we can make some adjustments, we can negotiate a little bit, and ultimately, he was such a flip-floppy type of guy, and we're going to see this throughout the revolution as well, that nobody ever believed that they could trust anything that he said. He wanted to make everybody happy, and in the process, he made nobody happy. In 1776, 13 of Britain's colonies declared independence. This, of course, is the beginning of what we call the American Revolution, or the American War for Independence. And again, they're doing it in large part because you had new taxes being implemented on them, particularly on the more well-to-do members of society. And those taxes were very appropriate for the fact that the colonists had just started a war with the French that had cost the British tons of money. They had to be able to pay off their debts in some way. Why not have the people that started the war pay for part of it? But the Americans weren't too big on that. And so they declared their own independence. The French loved this, though. Britain had been a longtime rival of France, going back centuries. Britain had beaten them in the recent wars, particularly the Seven Years' War, taking some of France's colonies, including the colony of New France that in the modern day we call Canada. And the idea of helping out the rebels was a great way to kind of stick it to Britain. At first, the French just sent weapons and supplies. It's not cheap, but that's not a whole lot of money in the big picture of things. But in 1778, the French formally allied with the Americans and went to war with Britain. The agreement was that when the war ended, the Americans wouldn't sign a treaty separate from the French, that the French would be able to be part of the negotiations for the final treaty. And of course, the French, what they really wanted was to make sure they got their colonies back. The Americans ended up breaking this promise. America in the late 1700s and throughout the 1800s was pretty notorious for breaking treaties. I'm sure you're familiar with the fact that just about any treaty made with Native Americans was broken at some point or other. But we started off this nation by breaking a promise with the French. We figured it was easier for us to get what we wanted if we left the French out of the final negotiations. And in 1783, the Americans signed the Treaty of Paris with Britain. France was not included in it, and after spending all that money for the Americans, France gained nothing in return. This sent the shaky state finances into a death spiral on their way to bankruptcy. And then, in 1788, 
there was a series of terrible harvests in France. With less wheat to make bread, the price of bread skyrocketed, which of course meant that many peasants started going hungry, some of them even starving to death. This is... This is not good. Now, food scarcity wasn't new to the French lower classes. In 1775, there were a few hundred riots in Paris and in the surrounding villages due to bread prices radically increasing. As flour became more scarce, the price went up. These were called the bread wars. But in 1789, the bread price inflation was even worse. In many areas, people starved to death. And hungry masses can very easily be turned into violent mobs. Also, among the lower classes, there was one group that had actually attained a lot of wealth over the previous couple centuries. The bourgeoisie. You can think of these folks as the middle class of France, though at this time the, quote, middle class was hella more rich than any peasant. This is like the difference between farm workers and lawyers. Both of them are not of nobility or royalty, but the differences between the two when it comes to income is huge. The same thing was true of the bourgeoisie and peasants in the early modern period. The bourgeoisie was living pretty good. Some of them were crazy rich, some of them were just doing all right, but they were all living incredibly better than all of those peasants in the countryside and low-level workers in the cities. That term bourgeoisie actually just means essentially city dweller, and it did include craftsfolk like blacksmiths, carpenters, cobblers, and bakers. It also included professionals like doctors and lawyers and teachers. Possibly most importantly, it included merchants. It was really trade stemming from the age of exploration that gave cities so much wealth by the time we get to the 1700s. The Industrial Revolution in the late 1700s was just starting up in northern France, and its entrepreneurs, the people that were building factories and starting to mass-produce goods, or hire people to mass-produce goods, all of those folks were part of the bourgeoisie. And even more powerful than merchants and industrialists, though, the bourgeoisie included bankers, the people who funded merchants' ventures and industrialists' building of machinery. Even though this bourgeoisie was becoming the economic backbone of France and were often even richer than many members of the nobility, they got no privileges that the nobility had. They weren't exempt from taxes. They weren't part of those parlements. They weren't included in king's councils. You can imagine this idea of, like, we're the ones making all the money. We're the ones paying the majority of the taxes, yet the nobility get to have special privileges and they get to be the ones that actually make decisions for our local region and get to advise the king on matters of the entire kingdom. It's also worth keeping in mind that these bourgeoisie were the same people who were reading Enlightenment philosophy. So while they were being successful in business but hadn't gained any political power, they were reading people like Rousseau, that dude who wrote a book called The Social Contract where he said that governments were only legitimized by, quote, the consent of the governed. It certainly doesn't seem like any of these bourgeoisie are being able to consent to being governed by the king or the nobility. Rousseau was the guy who wrote, man is born free, but he is everywhere in chains, claiming that most governments were tyrannical, taking away people's freedoms without their consent. The kingdom was still a hodgepodge of all these customs, laws, and taxes. It was an irrational system, something that all these enlightened folks did not dig. And in addition to having a more radicalized bourgeoisie capable of leading masses of hungry, poor folk, France had a king who believed in absolutism, but had little skill for it. He tried to find smart people to help modernize French bureaucracy and balance the books, but nobility resisted any change. And Louis XVI was such a pushover who so easily flip-flopped on issues that no rationalism, no reason, was brought to France's system of government. Now, beyond trying to create a more rational system of government, what Louis XVI really needed was money to stave off bankruptcy. And peasants had been bled dry. Remember, the peasants at this point were paying about half of everything they made towards taxes. They were the economic foundation of the kingdom. 
And they didn't have anything more to give. They were starving to death. You can't go to people who are starving to death and say, you have to give me more. You know that that's going to end in violence. So Louis XVI decided that he really needed to get the nobility and maybe even the church to start kicking in a little bit of scratch. When he had asked the nobility and other lead members of the kingdom to pay more in taxes, they agreed to work something out if he gave parlements even more authority in their regions and call for the meeting of something called the Estates General. The Estates General was France's version of England's parliament. It was made up of people from all over the realm. Traditionally, they voted on taxes proposed by the king. But the Estates General had not been called since Louis XIII was ruling. Absolutism had no place for anything democratic like this. So you have this old institution that hadn't been used for 150 years or so. And the nobility of the kingdom said, okay, we're willing to give some money to make sure this whole thing keeps running, but we want even more power for ourselves, both at the regional level, but also at the national level. The Estates General, though, wasn't exactly what we had called democratic. It was made up of three, quote, estates of medieval society, the clergy, the nobility, and then the commoners, everyone else. The first estate was the clergy, the people of the church. It was headed up by cardinals and archbishops who usually came from noble families, but it also included poor parish priests as well, and it made up somewhere between 0.5 and 1% of the population of France. As you can see here in this graph, it owned around 10% of all the land in France, and they paid about 2% of their income into uh, uh, the royal coffers. The second estate was the nobility of France. This included ancient families that went all the way back to the medieval period, though over the previous couple centuries, there had been a practice where bourgeoisie families who had enough money could actually buy a noble office. As you can see here, they made up less than 2% of the population, though they owned about 20% of the land, and these folks, by the time we get to the reign of Louis XVI, paid zero in taxes. The third estate was everybody else. This included peasants, but it also included bankers and blacksmiths and other members of the bourgeoisie. You see here this, this uh, term sans culotte. These were essentially the city workers, the working class. The peasants were by far the largest portion of this. They were about 80% of the third estate, but the third estate as a whole was about 97% of the entire country. And when the Estates General got together, by the tradition of that body, by the tradition of that institution, each estate got one vote. You can see this is problematic, where the clergy, making up about 1% of France, gets one vote. The nobility, making up around 2% of France, gets one vote. And then everybody else in France gets one vote in total. So all the, that the first and the second estate had to do was make agreements among themselves. When they voted on something, they would always be in the majority, even though they only made up about 3% of the population. When the Estates General was called in 1789, the king was really hoping that they would quickly approve new taxes and then go back home. But right off the bat, when they actually met in the Palace of Versailles, the third estate simply refused to play by the rules. Eventually this walked out of the estates general, and they were even joined by some of the poorer members of the clergy and even some members of the nobility. They formed what they called the National Assembly, and they claimed that they were the only ones who had the legitimacy to pass new laws in France. This is the beginning of the French Revolution.